Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8.16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8.31 I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, Syria's main biological and chemical weapons research center was bombed last week. Dozens of Iranian Revolutionary Guards were reportedly killed in the blast. A convoy carrying Russian-made SA-17 anti-aircraft missiles was also targeted and destroyed. The missiles were in the process of being transferred to Hezbollah terrorist in Lebanon when the shipment was hit. The New York Times reported that Israel has said that if it saw chemical weapons on the move, it would act to stop them. The Times article added that by hitting the research center, part of a military complex that is supposed to be protected by Russian-made anti-aircraft defenses, Israel made it clear that it was willing to risk direct intervention to keep advanced weapons and missiles out of Hezbollah's hands. Although Israel has not admitted responsibility for the strike against Syria's chemical weapons facility, there has been political fallout from the targeted bombings. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has accused Israel of attempting to destabilize his country, and he's also filed an official complaint with United Nations peacekeeping mission in the Golan Heights. Iran and Turkey have threatened Israel for attacking the Syrian factory, which was producing weapons of mass destruction. Desperate to keep Assad in power, the Iranian regime has released statements that it has its eyes set on retaliatory measures. Tehran said it will lend its full support to keep Syria strong. A spokesperson for the Islamic Republic said the Arab world has to do everything it can to minimize the suffering of the Syrian people as they fight against Israel's aggression and the international community's arrogance. Turkey's foreign minister slammed Syria for inaction against Israel after the strike and said that Ankara will not stand idly by while a Muslim country is attacked. Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Benny Gantz was hosted last week by the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff General Martin Dempsey. The two held a series of working meetings and discussed current security challenges, the regional security status in the Middle East, and military cooperation. Several news sources have quoted top-ranking U.S. security officials as stating that Israel notified the United States before the Syrian incursion and that Washington gave Jerusalem the green light to launch more strikes. At least 5,000 people were killed in Syria this January, making it one of the bloodiest months since the uprising began. Although the number of those killed varies among the different human rights organizations, there is no doubt the death toll has risen sharply as the violence in the country escalates. Head of the Israeli Institute for Security Studies, Amos Yadlin, has stated that Iran could have a nuclear weapon in four months. The former Israeli military intelligence chief told a forum that Tehran has completed components that enable the production of an atomic bomb as soon as it chooses to do so. The Jewish community of Australia expressed shock and outrage when Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard announced that national elections will be held on Yom Kippur. Known as the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur is observed by fasting, praying, and solemn repentance. No work is permitted on this day, and Jews could absolutely not participate in an election on Yom Kippur. Gillard defended her decision by saying that there were only a limited number of dates given the importance of football finals. She said, I do understand the significance of the day in question for the Jewish community, but many of my Melbourne Jewish friends would also understand 
the significance of an Australian Football League Grand Final. The United States Embassy in Turkey was attacked by a terrorist group last week. A suicide bomber detonated an explosive belt and a grenade outside the employee and staff entrance of the diplomatic compound in the Turkish capital, killing a local security guard and wounding several others. Statements released from the Revolutionary People's Liberation Party claim that one of the group's warriors carried out a so-called act of self-sacrifice by entering the Ankara Embassy of the United States, which it accused of being a murderer of people of the world. Israel officially boycotted a recent mandatory review by the United Nations Human Rights Council. The UNHRC released the findings of a fact-finding mission about Israeli towns in Judea and Samaria carried out to determine what effect those communities have on Palestinians. The UN agency also blasted Jerusalem for its proposed plans to build new homes for its citizens in the area known as E1. Israel responded that the review is another blatant expression of the organization's biased and long-established pattern of singling out Israel. Israeli Foreign Ministry spokesman Egal Palmor said that after a series of votes, statements and incidents, Israel has decided to suspend working relations with the UNHRC. The Sunday Times, one of England's most popular weekly newspapers, printed a highly offensive caricature of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The sketch shows Netanyahu as a bloodthirsty, red-nosed Jew building a wall with the bodies of Palestinians. Of particular concern was the appearance of the cartoon in the paper on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. After its publication, the Sunday Times admitted that it had crossed a line and apologized. A recent study released by the Washington Institute for Near East Studies reflects troubling details over increasing cooperation between Iran and Hezbollah. The report detailed the intensified and reorganized collaboration between the Lebanon-based terror organization and the hardline Islamic Republic's Quds Force to commit terror acts against Western countries and Israel. According to the report, Iranian decision-makers settled on a campaign of violence based on a three-tiered approach, targeting Israeli tourists, government figures, and representatives of Israel and the Jewish community. This comes on the heels of a warning from several U.S. intelligence officials that Iran and Hezbollah are becoming a significant source of concern for the United States and that the threat they pose is now being debated in Europe. Yochanan El Rome has more on that story. Yes, Aaron, both Hezbollah and Iran's Revolutionary Guards are designated as terrorist organizations in the United States, but the European Union has refrained from adding them to their terror list. Counterterrorism experts from around the world attended a conference last week in London on the threat of Hezbollah and Iran. Lord David Trimble and Jose Maria Osner, the former Spanish Prime Minister, co-authored an article which appeared in the Times. It said Hezbollah is already present and active on European soil. Its illegal activities and networks cover the continent. It has shown that it is willing to strike in Europe. That is why European governments must move now to stigmatize Hezbollah and its activities. Hezbollah is not the party of God. It is the party of terror, and we should treat it as such. The Israeli Water Authority has officially lifted its severe drought advisory. The head of the governmental agency released a statement, nevertheless cautioning that even though the water crisis has ended, the public should not become complacent, adding that basic water conservation rules still apply. He also noted that Israelis' adherence to these efforts helped overall water consumption to drop by 10 percent as compared with the previous decade. Stanley Fisher, the governor of the Bank of Israel, has submitted his resignation. He said that he is leaving the bank and the Israeli economy in very good shape and that he had achieved most of the goals that he set. He said that he was grateful for the opportunity to run the Bank of Israel, especially during a challenging period that included the global economic crisis, a complex geopolitical reality, and domestic and social issues. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu credited Fisher with playing a major role in Israel's economic growth and achievements. He said Fisher's experience, his wisdom, and his international connections opened a door to the economies of the world 
and assisted the Israeli economy in reaching many achievements during a period of global economic crisis. And that concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here on a beautiful day in Jerusalem on our rooftop studio. My guest today is syndicated talk show host, Danny Johnson. Danny, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Danny, tell us a little bit about what are you doing here in Israel? <laughs> well, like a lot of people, they like to come and tour this area. However, I'm also here kind of on a quest to go back to America and not only talk to everybody that I've got on Facebook, all of our clients at dannyjohnson.com and my radio listeners, stop dreaming about Israel and get here already. Come on, quit spending money on Starbucks and shopping at the malls and doing all crazy stuff with money. You have to experience and walk through the Bible here in Israel. So Danny, you have a media empire, a best-selling book, radio show, dannyjohnson.com. You talk about investing in your future. How is coming to Israel a good investment in a Bible-believing Christian's future? <laughs> um, first of all, if a Christian actually did that, they would probably know more <laughs> than most of the people preaching from the pulpits, which is really sad to say. But the bottom line is you cannot just expect to get the experience of the Bible by reading black and white text. Yes, God can inspire what you're reading, but there's nothing, I mean nothing, like going to a place like Shamron where Elijah was prophesying over the people, over the land. And when we were there just a couple of days ago, guess what we saw? We saw the fulfillment of the prophecies. He said that the Israelites would come back and that God once again would prosper their wine and their oil and their families. And that's exactly what he's doing. So there's nothing like experiencing it, walking in the footsteps of not only Jesus, but Elijah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Moses, Joshua, come on. Don't just look at Jesus as the reason to come here. It's even so much bigger than that. The Bible's a big book, cover to cover, and you can walk through it, you can eat through it right here in Israel. Quit wasting your money on Starbucks. Quit wasting your money on shopping every Sunday or Saturday with your family. Start taking that money every single week and get here and bring your family too. Well, you know, the tourism ministry has a great slogan. They say, if you like the book, you'll love the country. <laughs> and it really makes sense when you're here. You're someone who loves the book. You're yes. someone who believes in Judeo-Christian yes. guys. How has this changed your life being here in the land? Um, there's a lot of things that have happened to me since uh, being here. One thing that had such a massive impact for me personally was seeing how Israel takes care of each other. And not only that, they also love their neighbors. They're actually living this. And so, so it's very humbling to see that not only they're loving their neighbors, but also that they're helping those who are in need. And all of us at dannyjohnson.com, you know, we have a foundation called King's Ransom Foundation. And we help orphans all over the world to the tune of thousands and thousands of orphans we're feeding every single month, which is a biblical principle. And when you help, God helps you. And so I got to meet Rabbi Grossman yesterday, and that was phenomenal. You have to come to Migdal. You have to meet this man who is raising currently 6,000 kids. Did that impact me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you need to experience the people. You need to experience the love. You need to experience the honor. You need to experience the beauty. Quit sitting around over there on your lazy boy chair and get to Israel now. Well, Danny, what's amazing is that you've built this whole, you know, organization, the radio show, the books, on this concept of using Judeo-Christian values, yes, which is basically how Israel was built on that yes. concept as well. Yes. Have you seen uh, our nation-building ability uh, using those Judeo-Christian values in practice? Yeah. The reality is, is that uh, I grew up on welfare with violently abusive parents. I grew up with uh, a drug-infested home. I grew up in a place where I was emotionally abused verbally abused, mentally abused, sexually abused from the time I was three until I was 16. So I didn't have these, the, the principles, the Judeo-Christian principles in my life. I had to learn the hard way after being a homeless woman and hearing the voice of God tell me to pick up my mat and walk. I started a business from the trunk of my car in a payphone booth and became a millionaire inside of two years. Since then, 
My husband and I have helped many other people become millionaires, many other people start businesses, grow their careers, annihilate debt, and do it still having fun, traveling around the world, as well as keeping their families in order. And the unfortunate thing is in the Western world, if they actually read this book, and they actually experienced it, and they followed the bib biblical principles for wealth, the biblical principles for family, the biblical principles for building a business, building a community, building a life, we wouldn't have the troubles that we have around the world today. So honestly, if you want to succeed, you need to get to know your Bible. And you can't get to know your Bible on a Sunday morning once a week or a Bible study on Wednesday. You got to go deeper, start in Genesis, end in Revelation, and start experiencing it. And I want you to add now a trip to Israel for you and your whole family. Let them feel the presence of God in this place. Let them feel the Judeo-Christian uh, principles that have worked for, uh, hello, not two years, hello, not 2,000 years, hello, thousands of years. You gotta come. Danny, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? <laughs> you need to get here. <laughs> if, if you haven't caught that message, I don't know what's wrong with you. Listen, if you go to Facebook right now, if you go to facebook.com forward slash Danny Johnson Live, I've been actually journaling uh, several times a day the experience is here. Start getting it in you. Look at the pictures. See the posts. Start experiencing some of the videos that we've actually put there. You need to stop dreaming about Israel and you need to make it a reality. And there's, there's not too much in between the two lines. The dream to the reality is book a plane ticket. Get here now. <laughs> thank you, Danny, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. The great American university. For some, it's the route to riches. For others, a path to the endless party. But for many students, it's a time to broaden one's mind and begin to shape the world we live in. University has always been a crucible for social change and reform. And we see that today, students are standing up against the occupation of Tibet, the massacres in Darfur, and the war in Iraq. But there is one issue that seems to evoke more passion and hostility than any other. I think the situation on campus generally is a deteriorating one. This is for my grandfather. The college campus is the battleground for and against uh, Israel and uh, Jewish interests around the country. It isn't a joke. It's not just about people trying to say, here, look what's going on in the Gaza Strip. It's about taking the Middle East war and bringing it to campus in an intellectual framework that didn't really allow for freedom of speech. We Palestinians have nothing to dialogue about with Zionists. Very often, the efforts to, the more extreme efforts to discredit Israel on the college campus are nothing more than an outlet for good old fashioned anti Semitism. In a, new, in, a, in a new war. I happen to like Natan Sharansky's definition of when it becomes anti-Semitic. He talks about the three Ds. If you delegitimize a country, if there's a double standard about that country, and if you demonize a country, that is anti-Semitic. It's delegitimization of Israel, someone who claims that Israel doesn't exist, and for someone who claims that the entire country should be Palestine. Israel, Israel really doesn't meet the requirements of a legitimate state. Hey, hey, 
Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, oh, oh. If history is any indication, there'll be peace when you're gone and when we're in control again. When you talk about dissolving the nation state or destructing the nation state, that is anti-Semitism because at that point you no longer are talking about helpful critiques and criticism of how to improve that country, but how to get rid of that country. And no other nation state is held in that um, manner. But it's acceptable to talk about no longer having Israel as a homeland for the Jewish people. Zionism must be destroyed. It must be gotten rid of. Every aspect of it. You have a double standard where other countries are, are doing terrible things, human rights abuses, but only Israel, the finger points to only Israel, so there's this, this double standard. And demonization, when Israel is accused of behaving like a demon, uh, shooting children in the backs, that is anti-Semitic. They stage in die-ins and they act as if they are Gazans who are being attacked by Israel. And this is in the middle of campus, so the average person walking by obviously sees it. And they don't always question it, so they automatically see Israel as the oppressor. Recently, in a free newspaper on campus, we found cartoons that basically portrayed Israelis as Nazis in the full Nazi uniform, shooting at Palestinians in a trench. It, it, it's despicable, and it, it's, it's, it's terrible that this stuff's going on, and, and it really affects Jewish students. Jewish students see these things, and they think, where am I? What, is, this, is this 1939 Germany? No, I mean, we're in 21st century universities. It's unbelievable. Israel, Israel, you can hide. We charge you with genocide. The question is, how do you get, how do you get people to hate Israel? And um, however they do that, however they can do it, they will do it. Stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Have you ever wondered what happened to the lost ten tribes of Israel? This is a question that has challenged Bible scholars and historians for centuries. Now the Bible does tell us that as the Assyrian Empire came against the northern ten tribes some 2,700 years ago, that there were members of the northern tribes who heeded the warnings of the prophets and they fled south to Jerusalem and to the kingdom of Judea. Others who were taken into exile came back with Ezra and Nehemiah and rejoined the Jewish mainstream. And so we can say with confidence that the Jewish people we have with us today contain significant remnants of all 12 tribes. Yet there were many from the northern ten tribes who were indeed lost to history, and the search for them goes on to this day. Now the body that has the final say in determining who truly has Jewish ancestry are the chief rabbis of Israel who sit here in the great synagogue in Jerusalem. In the late 1970s, a few individuals from a small group located in northeast India began to research the origins of their religious traditions and their ancestry. Their research led them to discover an ancestral connection to Israel. Under Persian rule, their ancestors traveled through the Silk Route to modern-day Afghanistan, Tibet, China, and finally to Northeast India, in the midst of Myanmar and Bangladesh. 
This particular group, called the Bene Menashe, or Sons of Menashe, are believed to be descendants from the lost tribe of Manasseh. In the early 1980s, members of the group made contact with an organization in Israel expressing an interest in returning to their ancient homeland. Recently, I was part of a delegation from the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, which was privileged to welcome 53 members of the Bene Menashe tribe home to Israel at Ben Gurion Airport. It was a remarkable experience, and what really stood out to me is the sense these people had that they were carrying the weight of so many generations that had longed to come home. They realized they had the privilege to be the ones to stand for the first time back in the land of Israel. It was a hope they had carried for generations. The Christian Embassy supports the return of the Bene Menashe because we believe it is the incredible handiwork of God. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 43 promises, I will bring your descendants from the east. For the 13 families that we recently welcomed home at Ben Gurion Airport, the long journey for them was finally over. But there are still 7,000 Bene Menashe remaining in Northeast India who are longing to come home, and we've committed to help them. The return of the Pnei Menashe, the sense of Menashe, to the land of Israel is one of the most exciting developments of our days. This is exactly what the Bible speaks about in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3, where God says He will bring back from captivity the sons of Israel, the house of Judah, back to their land to possess it. And we want to invite you to become part of this exciting end time prophetic action of God and to place a financial seed into God's return of the chosen people to the land of Israel. Become a partner of the Christian Embassy and help us to bring the Pnei Menashe, the sons of Menashe, back to the land of Israel. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.